Welcome to the Intelligence Briefing Live, What's the Buzz? Where leaders and hands-on experts share how they have turned hype into outcome. Today, we'll talk about managing your leaders' expectations when running AI projects. And I figured who better to talk to about it than someone who's got a ton of experience in startups and corporates doing just that, Maya Mihailov. Hey, Maya, thanks for joining. Hi, Andres, thank you for having me. Awesome. Hey, um, why don't you tell our guests a little bit about who you are, what you do, and uh, how, how you got here? Absolutely. Um, my name is Maya. I'm co-founder and CEO of Savvy AI, where we help bring machine learning tools to every team. Um, before that, my previous company, GP Shopper, was bought by Synchrony Financial, where I went on to start a new division at Synchrony and be the general manager of a division leading in fintech product innovation using AI and machine learning technology. So we built a lot of products using AI and machine learning for the bank. And here I am. <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, um, again, thanks for joining. It really sounds like you've seen quite a lot, uh, especially both in, in startup and in corporate. So for uh, those of you in, in the audience, if you're just joining the stream, drop a comment in the chat where you're joining us from today. I'm really curious to see how global Hi, audience, audience is. <laughs> right. Um, and don't forget to subscribe to my newsletter, The AI Memo, under intelligence-briefing.com slash newsletter. So, but... Maya, should we play a little game to kick things off? What do you think? I guess we are. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, hey, this one is called In Your Own Words. When okay. I the, well, when I hit the buzzer, the wheels will start spinning. And when they stop, you'll see a sentence. And I'd like you to answer with the first thing that comes to mind and why. In your okay. own words. Right? Um, and to make it a little more interesting, you'll only have 60 seconds for your answer. So, All right, I'm ready. I've been practicing uh, my game show. <laughs> perfect. Um, and so, folks, for, for those of you watching this live, also drop your answer in the chat and why. Um, before I ask you if, if you're ready, let's take a quick look. So we have folks joining from India, from Pleasanton, California, from Warsaw, Poland, um, from New York, all over the place. That's awesome. And Michael from Arlington, Virginia. It's awesome. Thank you for, for being with us today. All right, so now, Maya, are you ready for What's the Buzz? I am ready. No whammies. Fantastic. Then let's roll. So if AI were a bird, what would it be? 60 seconds? Go. I think recently AI would be a phoenix. It has risen from the ashes of an AI winter where everyone said AI was overhyped. It was too much. It's not going to be useful. Companies can't execute against it. And when ChatGPT dropped on an unsuspecting world at the end of October, all of a sudden we saw interest in AI just rise from the ashes. And all of a sudden everyone wants to get in and know how it can transform their companies, transform their teams and the way they work. Awesome. Hey, well within time and an awesome answer. So thank, thank you. you so much. Um, I, I, I agree, right? Uh, in, at the end of last year, we, we saw a lot of the, the media and experts talking up the next AI winter and then boom, right? Um, boom. Chat, I, I think there was something very visceral about ChatGPT. It's not so much, you know, yes, uh, transformer technology, large language models, very, very interesting. But I think what made it more interesting is the visceral connection that people had. They got it. Before AI was always behind the scenes, you know, our planes would arrive at the gate on time, our packages would come in, our, our, our Netflix suggestions were personalized. They didn't see the AI and now they could see it, get their hands on it. All of a sudden, in every boardroom, leaders are like, what are we doing? What's our AI strategy? How are we going to make this work? Because they themselves can see how it works. Excellent. Yes, I, I think that's that's exactly the point. And that's why I'm, I'm so glad we're having this conversation today about expectations, because I, I also see them, them rising right in, in the conversations that, that I have. To your point, it's always, so what are we doing with AI? And, and to your point, right? Now you can actually feel it. Um, yep. So look, I mean, if if you look at any leadership survey, pretty much AI is is somewhere at the top and uh, top of mind for business leaders. But I also feel when you actually do talk to leaders, there's still many that that are struggling to make sense of this whole AI thing. And I mean, I get it, right? It's it's not necessarily their their core competency, and most of the time, it doesn't even have to be. But I also feel that this limited literacy on on AI you know, creates some challenges and, and sometimes a mismatch of expectations. What do you typically see? 
Well, first of all, I think that I would challenge how much literacy they actually need because they do need a bit of AI and data literacy. But look, leaders don't necessarily know how to program, yet they use computers every single day. What most business leaders want to know is how will this be a workforce multiplier? How will this drive outcomes? What they do need to know is a realistic version of what AI can do for their particular company, given their particular data and their particular circumstances. They need to know the risks associated with AI, whether that's reputational risks, ethical risks, et cetera. And they need to know what they can do often with their current team. Many leaders are still hesitant in this economy to necessarily make a huge investment or a huge pivot into a new technology. They need to know what they can do today to achieve results in the short and medium term so that they can invest in the long term. So I think that that's kind of the premise of what leaders need. But to be honest with you, I've been talking to a lot of CEOs and CTOs recently. And in a weird way, they feel overwhelmed. It's becoming everything, everywhere, all at once problem. AI is everywhere. It's affecting everything. It's transforming every single thing you do, every job, every this, every that. And yet it needs to be boiled down to effectively communicate with them in a practical timeline, in a practical way. They need to know, hey, do you know this problem we've been having with how to efficiently roll trucks to get product from A to B? This is actually a machine learning problem. You can solve this with AI instead of trying to solve this with spreadsheets and with guesses. So they need to know how it will practically affect their business and generate outcomes. Excellent. Yeah, um, I think that that practicality is is really key, and and making sure it's connected to the business and, and actually starting with the business problem and not just you know the the usual uh, that, that we've seen all too often a technology looking for a problem. Yeah, um, and and I think to a certain amount they need to know how they could do it with the tools they have. Because if you start talking to your leadership about AI and machine learning and you start with a conversation that says, well, first, we need to hire the following 10 people that everybody else is trying to hire in this economy. We need to invest X, Y, Z money that we might not even have because we're doing some belt tightening. We need to undergo a 24-month data re-architecture project. And maybe, maybe after all of those things are done, we can start on our AI journey. And that's just, that's not what they want to hear. And that's not the reality of the situation. That's that's very true. Um, now, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you said you, you founded two startups, you've sold one of them to a large financial institution, and you've joined them as an AI leader, and especially in, in fintech being such a hot space and uh, a leading space. I was wondering, how have you actually managed those expectations towards your leaders in a corporate environment? What's helped you and in, in how you've gone about it? Well, I was really lucky at Synchrony Financial. I had an incredibly supportive leadership team. I had an incredibly supportive bo uh, board and they saw the potential of what we were doing. They saw AI, they saw machine learning, and they saw that it had potential, not just in these big use cases that every bank is going after, like anti-money laundering and fraud, but it had that potential as that workforce multiplier, as that you know intelligence level up of their software and their products. So in that sense, I feel like I was very, very fortunate. But the reality is also a lot of the support that we were able to get for our division was because we were able to tell a story. And we were able to tell a story around what we were building, around how the goals of what we were building aligned with what the company's goals were. You know, it seems pretty simplistic, but you'd be surprised at how many data leaders, AI leaders get kind of stuck in the mechanics of what they're doing and they forget, they get lost in the forest and they forget to bring it back to the overall corporate goals and objectives. We came armed with numbers. Here's how it's going to help. Here are the results that we're expecting. So and we didn't necessarily discuss with the board and leadership things like root mean square error or heteroscedasticity. Very few boards want to discuss heteroscedasticity. Maybe at OpenAI they do, but more boards are like, what are the outcomes? What are the risks? What can we accomplish by next quarter, by two quarters from now, et cetera? So when we framed this as a story and a narrative that they can digest and understand and pull back to their own corporate goals and objectives, we were much more successful. I think that's a really good recommendation, right? Uh, framing it and phrasing it in in simple terms and in, in, in terms that relate to these goals and, and to these objectives. Um, look, I'm, I'm wondering, 
also now because AI is so much more accessible and it's accessible to, to anyone. Right. And I feel if, if you've been, been following the news, even at the beginning of the year with well, I've been following the news so and, much that I'm inundated with news. Like there's like a new AI right. announcement while we're talking, like four new AI startups have launched <laughs> while, while we're having this conversation. <laughs> Fully, fully agree, right? It's it's so hard to, to stay on top of the news, and uh, some days it feels like your head is spinning, just trying to keep up. Um, now, I feel with with World Economic Forum and, and Davos at, at the beginning of the year, that's when I feel it, it was really propelled uh, as as a topic again, and, and it was so so much top of mind. Now, with AI and generative AI being so so accessible um, to anyone, including business leaders. Um, where it's no longer just a technology conversation. How how do you see these these or management of, of these expectations? Because hey, look, Chat GPT is super easy. It's super simple to use. I can just pop in a question and, and I get a response. Why can't we do that? How do you manage that that gap between what you mentioned? Right. Uh, there, there are some fondan- uh, foundational things that you need to have in place. Some are there. Some are on, on the way of of getting there before you can um, use generative AI. Does it always have to be? built from scratch, for example, or or most of all, how do you manage that expectation? Well, I think the first thing is, is, and I I really, I really have a, a lot of sympathy right now for AI leaders because they have to walk such a fine line. They have to walk a fine line between sort of being hype master, which and you know the, the hyper of AI is eventually going to lead into problems when it doesn't do all the magical things that they read about in the media. And they have to walk a fine line between being like a wet blanket and sandbagging all the results so that the overall company gets impatient or the business gets impatient with waiting for these deliverables to happen. So they're right now juggling a lot of plates. But the reality is, is that first of all, a business with generative AI, they need to establish a framework. They need to establish a framework of behavior of what's okay. They need to establish a data security framework. You know, the the folks at Samsung, those developers may not have known that they can't put proprietary super secret chip data into ChatGPT because it helps them document or QA a process that they were doing. We're human beings. Human beings naturally gravitate to convenience. So the first thing the company has to do is figure out a framework of what makes them comfortable with these generative AI tools and then establish a knowledge base, you know, help um, let that empower the SMEs, excuse me, to establish a, a knowledge base because they know how these tools can help their businesses and help their businesses succeed. And so they can establish a, these are the top prompts I use. But the second thing is, and and this is very, very important. AI is not just ChatGPT. And even though ChatGPT is the thing we can wrap our brains around, there isn't one model to rule them all. This isn't Westworld quite yet. So there isn't this one magic model that's going to solve your problems. ChatGPT will not tell you which truck to roll in your warehouse. Chat GPT will not make a continuous decision for you about what piece of content to put in front of which users at any given time on your website. It won't do certain things. So the first thing you have to do is kind of reframe your management into there are certain things that Chat GPT is good at. There are certain things that AI vis-a-vis machine learning or optical recognition is good at. And then look at your problem set. So the first thing you have to do is Go look at the problems across your business and establish a roadmap of what can be reasonably accomplished. What are these small and mid-sized wins that can be accomplished with small to mid-sized risks so that you can start building credibility for larger AI programs if your business is a little bit hesitant about it? If your business is just saying, get on the gas, go, 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 well, there certainly is more opportunity there. But on the other hand, you also have to think again about data privacy, about data security, and about the ethics of what you're doing and where it can be used and where it cannot be used, not just because you're in a regulated industry, but because you're not going to fire hose all your company's private data into somebody else's open model. I think, again, there's a lot of... uh... A lot of insight and a lot of truth that that you're sharing there right because things that you've built before the the advent of, of generative ai they're still valid and they're still yeah. needed they're right? so like, valid not they're like so we're throwing needed. it out the window now um you know I people think- ask me what i do and i was like i'm just in boring machine learning you don't want to talk about that but the reality is it's that boring machine learning that's actually going to be 
that workforce, that hidden workforce multiplier while everyone else is too busy putting into chat GPT, how do I write a memo to management about the wonderful things we're doing with AI? Right. <laughs> Excellent, yes. Hey, I'm, I'm taking a look at, at the chat and I see Michael as, as the insightful question here. And he says, hey, will domain-specific tools like Bloomberg GPT for finance or Harvey AI for legal research become the new normal in the next 24 months? What do you see? What do you believe? I think these hyper-tuned, when you're talking about large language models and some of these generative AI models, I mean, I, I really think that you're just going to see some, some specialization as companies discover that they don't need the whole history of language. They need language that's specific to their business. They need knowledge that's specific to their business. So do I see a rise in purpose-built tools that are specific to certain industries like healthcare or like Bloomberg GPT? Absolutely. But I still see a wide range of problems that are that are very common across many businesses that AI and machine learning can address. But yeah, I definitely, I, I definitely see with large language models, um, there's going to be a lot of kind of hyper tuning, if you will, against certain industries and certain data sets as companies will also demand like their own LLM because they don't want to necessarily feed back that data into a generalized model, especially if it's company, like if it's chip design data, that's the most proprietary data they own. That makes sense. Yeah? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think it'll be re really interesting seeing where, where this goes and, and how many of, of, of these models or what types of models will be available publicly or, or will be available commercially to, to the point of you know Bloomberg GPT and, and similar ones. Um, I think definitely an exciting space that we, we get to be a part of and, and get to shape over, over the next couple of years. Yeah, it's a, it's a very exciting space. And I, I think it's it's evolving. I mean, not just because there's new news coming out about, you know, transformer models and LLMs every single day. I think it's an exciting space because companies are still trying to figure out their way through it and figure out, you know, we've been told for the last decade that data is oil, that our data is the most precious resource we have as a business. We have to protect it at all costs. And now all of a sudden people are saying, well, now just put all of that in my black box model. So I think a lot of companies are trying to figure out, is that the right strategy for us? What is the right strategy for us? What types of AI or machine learning work for us versus what types don't really generate a huge benefit to the business? And again, what can we execute today in the sh uh, short to medium term to start getting some of these results under our belts and some of this learning and experience? I do have a follow-up question to, to, to that one. And, and what we've also talked about, you know, not throwing the old AI stuff out the window. And that is in, in, in all of this, you know, excitement, hype, but also complexity, technical complexity, um, new security, ethical questions coming up. What role do you see AI leaders play? What, what role can they play in, in their organizations right now? What do they need to do um, to help their organization be successful and, and grow and thrive in the generative AI era? I think they play a very important role right now because right now they're the ones educating the organization. They're the ones creating this framework. And that's what's really important to create a framework where your company can succeed, to create a security framework, a data usage framework, you know, a knowledge base. They're at the forefront of these data leaders, these AI leaders are at the forefront of helping their company design how this AI transformation will affect the business in the next year, five years, 10 years, they have a very, very important role to play. And they have an important role to play into educating teams into what AI can do for them and can't do for them. Because again, the more there is a sensationalism about what AI may become and that it may take over humanity and you know welcome our new AI overlords, it, they have a role to play in saying, look, this is what this means for you today. This is what we can accomplish with our team today. So I, I think that they are they are both the educator and they are the realizer of some of those corporate goals and objectives. That's awesome. I think that's a fantastic message for, for those of you in, in the audience. If you're in an AI leadership role or aspiring to become an AI leader, there's a real opportunity and especially also a real need here um, to, to help your company, to help your peers, to help your leadership better understand what all of, of this AI stuff is about and, and what's tangible and what you can do with it and what you can't or shouldn't be doing with it, right? 
Absolutely. So, and yeah. as as Jesse just pointed out, to lay the foundation right now of a successful AI transformation, because that is what's next. We've, you know, we've spent the money um, creating data streams, data rivers, data lake houses. I don't, I, I don't know what else we're building on that data, but um, we data whitewater rafting, if you're in California this spring. <laughs> yeah. um, we've spent the resources to do that. And now it's time to put that data to action. And that's what it, the promise of AI is, is that automation, that you know, that productivity and efficiency gain of putting that data to work for us rather than just staring at it on a dashboard. Fantastic. Hey, maybe can you summarize the three key takeaways for our audience today because we're getting close to the end of the show? Absolutely. I think, first of all, when talking to your leadership about, you know, data and AI projects, specifically around AI projects, you have to ground them in what can be accomplished. You have to ground them in what can be accomplished today with the resources you have and what your roadmap is in the future. I think you also have to help educate them as to the different types of AI, that it's not just chat GPT is the one model to rule them all, that there's still machine learning out there. There's still other types of AI out there that can help their business more practically in the short term and accomplish the results they need. And finally, I think you have to remember that this is a longer term effort. All of this transformation that we talk about, all of these AI gains that we're talking about, they don't necessarily happen tomorrow. So I think there is a line to walk between getting your leadership excited, bringing it back to their goals and objectives, and realizing that you're at the beginning of a journey. So show some wins during the journey, tell the story, tell how it relates back to your business objectives, but don't forget it is in fact a journey. That's awesome. I think that's a very practical and a very realistic assessment as, as well, that it is a journey and that you're, you're in it for, for, for the long run and, and not, just, uh, not just for a sprint. Yep. Um, so, hey, thank you so much for, for joining us, Maya, and for sharing your expertise with us. It was great having you on, on the show. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, everybody who joined us. We didn't make the 100, so Andreas isn't as wearing his glitter bunny ears, but next time, next time he promises he will <laughs> exactly all right folks for you in the audience thank you so much for joining and see you next time for another round of the intelligence briefing live what's the buzz bye-bye